It gives me a great pleasure to introduce to you a very good and dear personal friend, Lali Graham Weymouth, or Elizabeth Lali Graham Weymouth, who is uh, one of the leading journalists, uh, international journalists of our time. Many of you, I guess, read her amazing interview in the Washington Post. Uh, and in the next uh, zero minutes, maybe we get a little bit more budget. Three, five, six, nine, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, good. 16 minutes, you are going to be exposed to some, oh, it's going down. Some of uh, very interesting uh, facts about how very high level uh, journalism is being done. This was quite a promotion, Lali. Now you have to stand for it. Lali, what is the nature of your work in the Washington Post? Well, um, for, for years I've been doing uh, interviews with world leaders, with heads of state in different countries around the world, Q and A's, question and answers, asking Good. them what they think and, and telling the public, printing it for the public so they can read what these people think. Can you share, us, share with us some of the more interesting names you interviewed? Well, I've interviewed uh, many people, as you know, Yossi, from uh, years ago, I interviewed, did the first interview with Saddam Hussein, and recently I interviewed President Sisi for the third time, actually, in uh, Egypt, just a couple of months ago. Who else? Give us more names. <laughs> uh, Gaddafi, I've interviewed Hafez al-Assad, the father, twice. I've interviewed this Assad, President Assad, once. Years ago, I'm happy to say I wouldn't do it now. Iran. And Mubarak. I've interviewed, uh, gosh, I, I, could, I could go on for hours. The pres a a prime minister of Japan last fall in South America. I've done President Ahmadinejad. Dilma. Ahmadinejad. Ahmadinejad in Tehran, yes, indeed. Okay, Ahmadinejad, Gaddafi, Saddam Hussein. Whom did you like the most? <laughs> well, <laughs> I like the most. Huh? Well, Saddam, um, Ahmadinejad gave me a great uh, story, actually, because we had, there were three American hikers that were at that time in jail in uh, Tehran. And much to my surprise, um, I asked him the first question, which is, uh, will you uh, pardon the hikers who were already in jail, who were three Americans who'd wandered into Iran? And to my utter amazement, he said yes, which I, I thought he would say it was the problem of the judiciary. But he didn't, and I said, oh great, well can they go home with me or are they going home with you? Because it was right before the UN a couple of years ago. <laughs> and uh, he neglected to say that the Omanis would have to intervene and pay a certain ransom in between, but he told the truth. And actually, th he did free the hostages, and that's why obviously I was given the interview in order that he could announce this to the American audience. Good. Uh, how are you able to get to do all this interview that uh other journalists may give uh, their right hand uh, or left hand to get these kind of interviews. Well, I would say part of it's luck and part of it's persistence and part of it's sometimes you run into somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. Yeah. And sometimes it doesn't work, unfortunately. It's great when it does work. And, and I've been, like, by chance I interviewed uh, Sisi when he was chief of military intelligence in 2011. And the editors of the Washington Post were madly disappointed because they wanted me to interview Tantawi, who was then uh, Minister of Defense of Egypt. And I wanted to interview Tantawi, so I was also disappointed. They gave me this guy, Sisi. No one had ever heard of Sisi. He was Chief of Military Intelligence. And of course, six months later, he became Minister of Defense. Then I did my second interview with him when he was Minister of Defense, and the Muslim brothers were in camps in the middle of Cairo, and bombs were going off. And then my third interview I did with him recently in the Presidential Palace. So I guess it, that, that helped in the sense that I think he knew me, he knew who I was, so it helped get the interview, and because I'd interviewed him before. Uh, by the way, speaking about how you get interviews, can I share with them <laughs> what I saw in, in uh, China a month ago? Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so Lali and I happened to be in the same conference in China, and we had breakfast together, and then a guy that both of us, I, I think, didn't know, he recognized Lali. Well, he, he recognized you. He recognized me, okay, whatever. And we began to talk, and then he mentioned a name that he knows somebody in his surrounding. I don't know if you want me to announce that. No, let's leave. One of the world leaders that. 
one of the countries that you would just love to interview somebody in. Yes. And we're in the South China Sea in this hellhole, Yossi and I. Yes. And uh, Hanan, a place I suggest you do not visit. But, no, no, uh, no. This is, you don't do this. Uh, sorry. That's not nice. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> we, we, I'm planning to go the next year. You okay, know? Now well, we will not be okay, able to go. Okay, it was a great there. conference. But anyway, right. it's like extremely N difficult. Nevertheless, so from that moment on, Lali was like a, a cougar. What is the name of this animal? Jaguar, you know, or sea who see a prey. I couldn't talk to her, she wouldn't listen to anything. She took a book note and just looked into the eye of this poor guy, I think you tried to hypnotize him, and she didn't leave him alone until she got all his social network documented on a paper and whom he's going to approach him. So how's, then I saw for the first time how you, how you, how you do it. Lali. And, and he did introduce me to somebody actually. Yossi and I thought it was 50-50 that he had any connections at all. But he did actually have a connection to somebody from that country, and he introduced me. And so I would say that was a shot in the dark, but it worked, and it was thanks to Yossi, actually. Ah, it was amazing. Nevertheless, who are the two world leaders that you are dying to interview and you were not able to, to get it so far? Well, I would very much like to interview uh, the president of China. And um, he's coming to the US for a visit in the fall. And I'd also, I'd love to interview uh, Vladimir Putin, who it do, never ever gives inter uh, press interviews, or at least um, printed press interviews. So anybody of you who can arrange for Lali to interview Putin or the president of China, please uh, arrange line after the, after the interview. How about uh, Castro? Yeah, I think that'd be great too. I think that's a little more possible, a little more doable. Or, or a senior Cuban leader. I think it's a little more possible. Okay, so we started what you are doing. Let's go now to the style and then to views. <laughs> Your style is Q&A. Yes, correct. Q&A, you write Q&A. How much you introduce judgment or <coughs> subjectivity or views or like, liking and not liking into your work? I, I try not to do that. I try, I mean, I think about the reader and I try to ask questions that I think... Um, Sophisticated people who have worked on that area, whether whatever country it is, whether it's Iraq or Egypt or Israel or whatever, I try to ask questions that will be of interest to people who are very knowledgeable about the area, and I also try to, to make the um, interview readable to people who actually don't are not experts uh, about the area. So I try to to address a broad audience. So I try to make the questions and answers, uh, especially the questions, accessible to people, and I try to elicit from the from the interviewee an answer that will be a headline or that will make news. Like I asked Sisi, I said, I heard you speak to Prime Minister um, Netanyahu every day or almost daily. And I expected him to say, no, I don't. And he said, yes, I do, which I thought was very interesting. The Washington Post used it as a headline in, in the uh, story. Good. So no views, no liking, just sheer. Yeah, I try to make it that way, yeah. Good. When, uh, when, you meet, when you meet a leader, you come with a prepared uh, list of questions or you develop them while you are speaking with him? Because I know that you do a lot of preparatory work, if, I, if you allow me to share with them. Uh. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, I call up everybody I, I can find on the face of the earth that knows about Japan or whatever country I'm going to, and I try to or, learn or, as much or as- Or Israel. Israel, whatever. And uh, I try to find out as much as possible and I try to he hear as many view different viewpoints as possible, and then I put together a set of questions. I don't necessarily use those questions, but I, I have them so I'm, I know what I'm working off of, and I know enough in economics, politics, so that I can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the leader, um, who knows a lot more than I will ever know, of course, for an hour. And um, so that's the trick, I think, is to be really well prepared. What is the reaction you get from the leaders a week later? Um, pretty, I would say pretty good, not, not bad. I mean, usually. I haven't had uh, too many complaints. Because um, really, we're giving them a pretty big uh, area to, to uh, say what they want to say. Usually, they do have a message of some nature. And um, I think on the whole, even if you ask them hard questions, uh, some of them have a, a very difficult time, I think, with the American uh, directness, You know, with the fact that you say, well, I hear that you don't have any, fr um, I interviewed Chavez in Venezuela, who was really a wild man. And I said, well. In what, in what way he was a wild man? <laughs> well, he was wild, but he was, you know, he was wildly popular with the population. You thought you were gonna be crushed under his feet when 10,000 people were trying to touch him. 
And um, he wasn't too interested in obeying the law or any such thing. So I said, um, well, can you tell me about your cracking down on the freedom of the press? And he's like, what an idiotic question. Who gave you that moronic question? And it was really a tough, it was a tough interview. And he went on like that. And he went on um, for about six hours like that. And it was really, and then in the final thing he said to me, which I thought was really absolutely the most amazing thing I've ever heard, heard any world leader say. This is after holding forth on every possible topic, a constitutional convention. He would roll down the window of the car and he'd get a kid and he'd say, tell her why I disbanded the constitutional convention. This poor kid recognizes Hugo Chavez. He's completely terrified. And he says, well, of course, you know, this, whatever they called him, the commander was, did this and it's a great thing to do. You know, what's the kid supposed to say? Meanwhile, people are trying to touch him. There are mobs all around the car. He's driving the car. His um, generals you, you are all around the car? Oh, yeah, I'm in the back with his generals who are all roaring with laughter at his every remark. And I'm sweating my eyes out. I'm like, General, you're giving me a really tough day back here. So, but he wouldn't let you leave. I mean, I said to the interpreter, I'd really like to go back to Caracas now. We were in eastern Venezuela. And she's like, no, 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 you can't do that without saying goodbye, you know, to the general or the president or whatever he was called. And, um, and so he says to me, the goodbye line was, he says, a revolution is like making love. You have to do it every day. I thought that was <laughs> really a classic. Tell me, Hafez El Asad, how long was the interview? Well, I, Hafez El Asad, I interviewed twice. Once the year after Hama, which I believe was 1983 for the first time. And then I interviewed him much later. And he was famous for talking both to Kissinger and to, if you were lucky to be enough a journalist who saw him, for hours and hours and hours. And of course, in those days, um, in the f especially in the first interview, tape recorders weren't much in vogue yet. The second interview, they were in vogue. And, and I remember uh, there was a Newsweek reporter with me who was a great guy. And we had to dismantle the phone in the, in the hotel room in order to email it, which was email was very primitive in those days. And they wanted you to get some transcribed thing from the palace. So by the time that the palace arrived with their edition, Chris Dickey, the reporter from Newsweek, who's a great guy, had torn the phone apart, dismantled it entirely, wired it up so that we could email it to Newsweek, and it was gone. But Assad was a really tough guy. He knew what he wanted. And, um, you know, the Israelis, I, or some Israelis in military intelligence used to say that they believed at the end that he decided to make peace with Israel. I asked his son that when I interviewed his son, this president, and he was like, yes, that's true, and I agreed with it. Uh, I think his son is actually a mass murderer, personally, off the record, not being a very objective journalist. What do you mean, uh, off but the record, with 200 people in the room? Well, true. But anyway, it seems that, I, th I think the big question today for U.S. Uh, policy is it seems that Policymakers are discussing the fact that now um, he's going to stay. Of course, all the officials were saying years ago, as you know, that he had to go. And now, apparently, it seems that they're pretty well settled down on the fact that he's going to stay. And I would say the Turks and the Qataris are very unhappy with this. But the Americans seem to have accepted the fact he's going to stay. This was a very long answer. But the question was, how long was the interview? Uh, long. <laughs> long. How long? I don't know. I'd say four or five hours. Four and five hours. And what is the next question I'm going to ask? I don't know. You don't know. Hafez al-Assad is being known to use the length of discussion as a tool. Yeah, okay. To keep his people, uh, his, uh, his guests kind of uh, agitated, you know. What uh, happens if in, in a very long interview you have to go out, you know, nature calls? <laughs> I don't know. You don't know. No, I don't Never know. Never happened to you. No. You don't want to discuss it. No, it's OK. I was fine. But okay. That wasn't my problem. My problem was getting into his office, and it was fine once I was there. OK. Uh, you have, really, you have a view and opinion and experience and relations and connection in the external affairs of the United States, I think, more than most of the Secretary of States. Don't say no, no. You, you know you knew many leaders. You a very, very alert follower of what's going on. Would you be today the Secretary of State? What would you do? In what area? In the United States. No, but in what area of the world? I mean, there's so many areas that are, as choose you know. A, choose an area, tell us what you, are, what you would do. I, th I think it would be, I think the problem with the Secretary of State today is that power for making foreign policy decisions, as far as we can see, lies really in the White House. And so therefore, the real question should be, 
if you are the president. Exactly. Good. <laughs> who, is, who will vote for Lali as a president no, if she no, runs? No, no, no. No, I think the question should be, you know, if you were president, what would you do? And I have a great question. If you're president, what would you do? <laughs> well, the one thing that I can say as an observer is that everywhere I go in the world, um, and when I interview these people, and they always ask you a little bit about American politics or who do you think is going to win the election, stuff like that. So the one thing is, for, at first when Obama was elected, they were all very excited, and they thought it was just great. And now they do nothing but complain about him. When I was in Egypt, Sisi said to me, do you remember what I said to you last time when you were here two years ago? And I'm like, yes. And he's like, so what did I say? And I said, you said America has turned its back on you. And he said, exactly. And you hear that not only in Egypt and the Middle East, you hear it also in Asia. They feel that there's a gap, there's a, a lot, that America is not there, that America is not playing its usual role of, of leading. And I, I think that's the complaint that you hear. And if I were president, I, I hope, or if the next president, I hope, will be, will reassert an American presence in the world in a stronger way. Yeah, she will do it. <laughs> I don't know who will be the president. That's, you know, I think these people here would know better than I would. Let I, us, let us, time is running short. It's really very interesting. Thank you. How do you, how do you, how do you assess what's going on today in the Middle East, in, in our region? I think you would be a better expert than I would at that, Mr. No, I'm speaking with all the upheaval in the... Well, I, th I think the big, uh, the big situation, as you know, is, is the Iran, is the Iran um, a, a deal. And I heard Vice President Biden make a speech, and I was on the panel last uh, Thursday night, at the Washington Institute commenting on his speech. And he made a very forceful presentation and a very effective presentation, actually, in favor of the administration's deal with Iran. Um, you can believe it or not believe it, but it was, I thought it was a good presentation. And so the question is, I think many countries in your area are, are worried and scared of Iran and scared of what happens if Iran gets the bomb. Will they go and become nuclear? And, and you know, look at the situation in Yemen. Iran is obviously asserting itself all over the Middle East. And so, to all of you, thank you. Okay, now very quickly, because we have to wrap up, ISIS, one sentence. Oh, a nightmare. Um, I, did, everyone did, you, I speak, did you interview him? Everybody I speak to about ISIS, all the, if you speak to any defense person on background, they all say, you have to have some kind of American presence on the ground. And they don't mean American troops, they mean special forces or you know, intelligence or something. They just say you basically cannot do what President Obama said, defeat and degrade ISIS without any American presence on the ground. And you are for it? I'm just saying that those, that's what the experts say. You can uh, decide whether you're for it or, or not yourself. Um, I'm for defeating ISIS, let me put it that way. China vs. United States. Well, I think it's clear that China is the rising power. There's not a doubt in the world about it, and we should be paying more attention to it. Putin vs. Europe. Well, Putin's marched all over Ukraine where I was l for a week last year. And the question is, where will he go next? North Korea? A problem, but it's <laughs> there's so many problems that North Korea right now is, is just sitting there with his bombs and, you know. Okay, regretfully, our time is uh, okay. run out. Lali Weymouth, you are terrific. Thank you, Yossi. You are great. Thank you for coming.